Good. Morning, everybody. Yeah, so uh, as you will have noticed, I actually don't work for MLA. I work for a company called Cantar, which most of you have never heard of. But we are a research consultancy, and it's my job to collect the data for MLA both here in Australia and across the world that looks at what consumers are doing, right? where they're going, what they eat, what they like, and what they think about beef and Australian beef in particular. And I'm going to talk through global consumer megatrains, right? So this is all about consumers, this is all about where they're going and what they think. And I'm going to start with a definition, because megatrains sound a little bit like marketing hype. What is a megatrain? Really, this is a global trend. This is something big. It is a change within consumers, technology, government, finance, economics, that actually leads to a change in the way that consumers think and behave. Right? So these are really, really big things that have implications for the day-to-day -day lives of people who are buying products, who are eating meat, who are buying all sorts of different things around the world. And the question that follows up from that always is, well, should I really care? Um, yes, I think you should, not just because I'm going to talk about it for 15 minutes, but because this is something you should care about only if you're willing to make change. And that's why we look at these. That's why we care about megatrends, because getting ahead of these gives us advantages within these markets around the world and locally if we're willing to actually take steps to get ahead and to take advantage of these trends. I'm also going to talk about four trends. Now, I could talk about megatrends all day. We could literally have a conference just about megatrends. Um, and as much as I love hearing myself talk, I feel like that would be a bit too much. And the thing that's important here is I'm going to show you four, but they don't occur in isolation. I'm going to present them as four individual things, but they all interact, and they overlap, and they have sometimes competing interests within the way that consumers behave. So they don't occur in isolation. Try and remember that as I run through, is that these are going to be fighting head to head and sometimes bolstering each other in various places. Okay, so these are the four trends that I'm going to talk about. One, I'm going to talk about shifting economic power from west to east. Yeah? And that I've grouped together with some of the other megatrends. So the increasing middle class and increasingly aging populations. So those go together in, in interesting ways for us as MLA. I'll talk about that. I'm going to talk about experience over rationality. So I'm going to talk about here is the right reason and the real reason why people buy things uh, and what that really means. Number three, I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence and technology-enabled shopping. Yeah, it's a really interesting one about how people buy and how that's going to change. And that has real implications for us as producers, right? As people who are selling red meat around the world. And last thing, I'm going to talk about health and wellness. And this will be a big one. Everyone will, uh, will know that the internet is awash with various bits of health advice. And I'll try and unpick some of that and talk about what that means for us. Okay, so shifting economic power, increasing middle class, and aging populations. And what you'll see as I run through as well is I'm going to talk about the trend, and then I'm going to tell you what that really means for us as red meat producers, as beef producers, and why we should care. Um, so what we see here is that really power is moving west to east. You might see this referred to as the Silk Road um, in various bits and pieces. But that economic power is shifting, and that's led by Asia. So we know that Asia is taking far more of the economic power over the next 10, 15, 20 years. That combines with the fact that people are getting older. So increasing levels of health care across all of these markets, and actually across the world, means that people are living longer, right? So we expect now to be able to live to be 100 years old relatively easily. The population, 21% people in the world will be older than the age of 60 by 2050. And increasingly, that population will be urban, right? So just in China and India, we're talking about having a billion middle-class consumers who are older, living in cities, and what does that really mean for us? Well, firstly, it opens up opportunities for those countries to export things out, right? And we do see the increase in growth of particularly Chinese brands across the world. But it opens up space for us as people who are providing products that actually caters perfectly to that sort of environment, urban, middle and upper class people in these markets, right? I'm going to show you some examples of that. So on the left-hand side, I'm going to show you a lot of charts as well. Sorry, but I'll, I'll try and make them sensible and not uh, charty, try and avoid my researcheriness. So on the left-hand side, what I'm looking at is Chinese consumers, using China as an example, who earn less than $35,000 or more than $35,000, right? And there's two things that are important there. One, if you earn more, you are more likely to eat beef more often. So it goes from 1.85 beef, beef occasions per week to 2.05 you're also more likely to consider Australian beef as a beef that you would like to eat in that market from 86.9 to 89.9. Now, that doesn't seem like a massive difference, but just that is an extra 10 billion more beef occasions per year amongst a group of people who are more likely to choose Australian beef. 
That is a massive opportunity just in China. Here we're not even talking about the rest of Southeast Asia, any of these other markets that are growing. So the opportunity here is huge. And with, um, Michael was talking about access. This is an access thing, right? The more access we have, the more of those beef occasions we can take. That's the goal. The other chart that's on there is somewhat of a competing interest, which is the average age of people and how many beef meals they eat per week. And what you'll see is that that line goes down. So people that eat one or zero beef meals per week tend to be older. So the population, increasingly urban, increasingly middle class, increasingly wanting to eat beef, increasingly wanting to eat Australian beef, but we have an age problem to tackle as well, is that as people get older, they actually start to eat slightly less beef. Yeah? And that's going to somewhat overlap with point number four, which is health and wellness. Because what happens when you get to 50, your doctor says, Maybe you need to cut back on some things, right? And that's largely what happens. People start eating less and less beef around the world. And we'll talk about that as a health and wellness problem uh, and potential solutions there as well. Number two, this is just one slide, experience over rationality. Now, we all like to think of ourselves as really rational people, yeah? And we would talk here about the difference between the right reason that you buy something and the real reason why you buy something. The right reason, if I said to you, why did you buy that BMW, is, oh, well, you know, oh, it's really good value for money and really safe, yeah? The real reason is I think I look hella cool. Like, that's essentially what it's all about, right? Um, we buy things emotionally, and then we post-rationalize it into it being a rational decision. But it's not. It isn't. We're not rational people as much as we like to think we are. So consumer behavior is a blend of those two things. It's a blend of the rational and the emotional. If we look across our markets, 56% of beef choice is explained by something called meaningfulness. Yeah? Meaningfulness, which is, does it meet my needs? But importantly, do I love it? Right? Do I love it? And actually, you'll see this across just about every category besides really boring ones like cooking oil, um, which are slightly different. But we care about this, and we buy products that we love. Even in weird categories, we buy products that we love. It is far more important to be the family's favorite type of beef than it is to be the cheapest type of beef. And that's true of almost every category in the world. A good example of this is in Japan. Pretty much all of the influence that our beef equity has runs through something called Genki, right? Makes me and my family feel Genki, which is this deeply emotional sentiment that has no English translation. But it makes my family, my family feel energized and happy. Yeah? And that drives a lot of the choice in that market. Most of the choice in that market is being driven through that. And we underpin that with other things. It's hard to be the family's favorite if you're not tasty, if you're not safe, if you're not all of those other things. But make people love you, because love is a key driver of why we actually buy, even if we refuse to admit that to ourselves. Yeah. Number three, AI, so artificial intelligence, uh, technology-enabled shopping, and the Internet of Things. Lots of stuff on here. but. The internet and mobile devices particularly are devices that facilitate change. They don't produce change in and of themselves. What they do is they open up information and they open up ways of getting to information and ways of getting to products that didn't exist before. What we do see though is that grocery and particularly meat shopping has been very slow to change. Yeah? So the chart at the bottom is a bit hard to see, but the white bars are the number of people that have um, Internet access, all right? Sorry, that's the number of people that do online shopping in each of those markets. You then have grocery shopping, then you have meat shopping, then you, or beef shopping, and then you have Australian beef shopping right at the end. The key thing is that while there are markets where people do shop for beef quite a lot, so if you look at China, that's actually really, really high. In most of these markets, people don't. People don't buy meat online. Why? Because we fundamentally feel like if we don't choose it ourselves, then there's too much risk. But that is going to change and is already changing. Huge acceleration here. So 64% of people have never bought beef online around the world uh, within our survey. But this is the estimates going to 2022 about online shopping revenues around the world. We're talking about triple from where we are now in terms of US dollar revenues. This is growing and it's not going away. Um, we need to increasingly adopt this channel and push this channel because other people will right, online shopping channel, because it will start to impact on the way that people buy. And that's going to come from a couple of places. It's going to come from things like smart packaging, and it's going to come from big retailers who are trying to reduce the risk to you as the consumer in choosing products online. Yeah? The biggest of those is Amazon. So what Amazon will do, you will have, I'm sure everyone will have seen that Amazon bought Whole Foods, right? So a big push into grocery for them. Amazon will give you your money back if it's not good. 
So, thank you. Um, Amazon will just give you your money back, right? And they'll replace the product free of charge. They're trying to remove the risk to you. They're also trying to remove the friction in that ordering process, right? So what is friction? Friction is how hard it is to actually do. So Amazon with Alexa, Echo, Dash, and Dash buttons mean that you can walk into your pantry and say, oh, Alexa, order me more beef. And it'll order the type of beef that you ordered last week, the type that you told it you like, right? If you say, order me new washing powder, it'll order you the washing powder you always ordered. It takes all the effort out of that system, essentially. They're removing the friction, and they're removing all of the risk from consumers in doing that. This is where we are right now. This is going to be increasingly a bigger and bigger part of how people shop. The future looks slightly different, so I'm going to give you a brief glimpse into where we're all going. One is ordering on your fridge. So Samsung and LG already have this fridge you order on the door, right? Um, but the future is actually the fridge knows what you buy and reorders it for you without you having to reorder. Yeah? So it knows the type of milk, and it knows when you're getting low on milk or when your milk's gone bad, and it just orders you new milk, new beef, new whatever it is. Um, so that system increasingly is going to be connected into Internet of Things. So uh, everyone always laughs because I say smart toilets and they giggle. Um, but what smart toilets will essentially do is monitor health markers in your urine and then tell your fridge whether or not you've had too much salt this week, right? Or maybe you've had too much to drink. And it'll subtly start to adjust what it orders for you. Yeah. So the future is online shopping. The future of that future, increasingly, is all of your stuff making decisions for you without you actively having to really think about it very much. Yeah. This tech exists now. I, I wish I was making it up, uh, but it doesn't. I, I'm sure you'll have advertising on your smart toilet by 2025. <laughs> and this is going to be powered by machine learning. So this is something called IBM Chef Watson. Watson is a machine that you can feed unstructured data, and it learns things. And at this one, they fed it a whole bunch of recipes and a whole bunch of food, and it decided on synergies. And what this essentially will do is tell you things that go well together, even if you would never put them together by yourself. And this will be powered by this, largely going to run through your mobile phone, and it'll suggest what you should be eating by taking all of that preference data, everything that it knows about what you like, everything that it knows about your health markers, and telling you what it is that it thinks you should eat and will like. And people go, oh, I'd never listen to my phone. Yeah, sure, but I listen to my phone and it tells me when my next meeting is and what time I have to leave and what the traffic looks like and what the weather is like. Yeah? And we trust these devices, and that's going to become an increasing part of our lives. That taking away the friction and the effort that I have to put in. Okay. Health and wellness is my last of the trends. We see an explosion of health and wellness trends in the last couple of years. Um, does anybody here know a low-fat, high-carb, raw food vegan? Yeah? <laughs> There's always a bit of a tricky one in, in beef conferences that people don't like to admit that they know these people. But they exist, and they're all over the place. Um, and the internet facilitates this. The internet is basically this uncurated flow of information, not all of which is good. Uh, and it makes some things which are actually quite fringe um, into the mainstream. But it doesn't really matter what trend you're talking about. So we're talking about veganism, transparency, health, free range, low carb, high fat, high fat, car low carb. It doesn't really matter. The internet and what these trends reveal is an increase in people taking control of what they eat. What they eat, where it comes from. Yeah? That's essentially what this comes down to. And this is an internet related problem. We see healthy lifestyles becoming really a normal way of life across the world. And we know that this impacts on meat consumption, right? And the biggest brunt of that goes to beef consumption. So this is the percentage within mar each market of people that are avoiding meat for health reasons. And you'll see that that's relatively high. So about 50% in Indonesia, all the way down to about 14% in Jordan. So this is people avoiding meat for health reasons. And that looks relatively scary in some ways. I'm going to talk about how that's changing, right? One thing is that we know traditionally where this is coming from is from fat, people being scared of fat. So yes, we are the low-fat option in many of the countries around the world. Um, but this is a study that we did looking at people who basically reject fat. Uh, and you can see there's a strong correlation between countries with high levels of fat rejection and countries that avoid red meat and beef in particular. The good news, because um, I'm nothing except someone who gives good news, is that actually the world is changing and sugar is the new fat. So 30 years of nutritional dogma is starting to shift and people are avoiding sweet foods more than they are avoiding red meat. So you're talking about 36% of people on average saying they're avoiding meat, 61% say that they are avoiding um, sugar. Yeah. So sugar is the new fat. And in the left-hand side, you can see Google trends of low fat versus low carb. And what you see is that low carb is that white line, is the, um, 
sorry, yeah, low fat is the white line, low carb is the yellow line. They follow the same trend, right? In that, that little spike, that's January 1st. That's when I go, time to hit the gym, lose those 20 kilos I picked up eating Christmas pudding. Um, but <laughs> the interest in eating low carb has gone up exponentially over time. The interest in eating low fat hasn't actually. So sugar is the new fat and that opens opportunities for us. A market that has done very well on this is butter. So butter is back, you can see this all over the media, but global butter production is going up 14% from 2014 to 2020. Um, butter is everywhere, right? It's back on McDonald's menus, and that's really because fat has become acceptable again. Yeah? And we can take advantage of that same trend, this trend towards sugar. So I'm out of time, but I'm gonna leave you with four things about what we should actually be doing. One, we should aggressively pursue access in markets where we know our future consumers are gonna come from. Two, remember that food products, like all products, are not just about the product. They're not just about the price. They're not just about um, knowing that it exists. It's about the fact that we love it. It's about a deeper emotional connection and driving that, make people love you. Three, embrace online shopping avenues now because other people and other competitors that do will have a jump start. That is where the world is going and we wanna be first cab off the rank. And four, stay ahead of emerging health trends and take advantage of shifts Take advantage of the fact that sugar is actually enemy number one, because it's a great time for us to be really getting into that space, despite the fact that the internet might not always tell us that that is true. And that is it for me. Thank you very much.